morning. I'd like to read several verses while you remain seated. Normally we would stand for the reading, but you'll be standing a while because we have several verses. Let's go to Luke 24 and 45 to begin with. And for about a month and a half, we drilled down pretty deep into why water baptism was necessary. We said, when should I be baptized? How should I be baptized? Why should I be baptized? And then we dealt with some common misconceptions about baptism, infant baptism, baptism in proxy for other people. We dealt with all that and uh, who is authorized to baptize people. So hopefully as a takeaway from about five or six weeks of in-depth study on baptism, hopefully you have a, a clearer understanding. I know everybody's at different levels in their spiritual growth. And the good thing about having an in-depth study is everybody that was exposed to that should get to the same level with regard to that topic. Amen? And so we, we want to do the same thing, but with regard to the topic of the Holy Ghost, the necessity of the Holy Ghost. Luke 24 and 45. Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. He said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it behooved Christ to suffer, to rise from the third, the dead, the third day. We, we believe Jesus Christ went to the cross. We believe he rose the third day. And Jesus is speaking, rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands. He blessed them. Came to pass while he blessed them. He was parted from them and carried up into heaven. This is the same incident that's recorded in Acts chapter 1, the first part of chapter 1. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he said, ye shall receive power, Acts 1 and 8. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. And while they beheld these things, as he was speaking, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. This is what we call the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Luke is recording it in the last chapter of Luke. But Luke is also the author of the book of Acts. So Acts chapter 1, the first few verses, were written by the same guy who wrote Luke chapter 24. And he tells the same story. I read this because we read this ad nauseum for a, a, a several weeks. Verse 47, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. We believe repentance is necessary. We believe remission of sins through baptism is necessary. But if you read on, two verses later, Jesus wasn't done talking to them about what they need to do. He said, once you repent and once your sins are forgiven, then, verse 49, the promise of the Father is going to come upon you. That's the Holy Ghost. Everybody say the Holy Ghost. Now let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. This is the day of Pentecost, which was a Jewish feast day. Penta, P-E-N-T-E, -E, P-E-N-T-A means five or 50. A pentagon, the pentagon has five sides to it. Largest pentagonal structure in the world. A pentagram has five points on it. Amen. And so the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Pentecost means 50 days after the Feast of the Passover. Last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, celebrating 50 days since Easter. What we could consider Easter, the Jews would consider the Passover. So we're in Acts 2, 1 through 7. This is the day of Pentecost. It's a Jewish feast day. And Luke begins to say, this is what happened on this special day. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Everybody say the Spirit. 
So this is a heavenly thing. This is a godly thing. Because Luke says it was the Spirit that caused them to do this. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. When this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. They were confounded. Why? Luke says, well, it's because every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? So you have to understand what was happening. Acts chapter 2 is a fascinating story. It goes on to list 18 different nationalities of foreigners that were in Jerusalem, the holy city, visiting during this special feast day. So they came from all over the world for the day of Pentecost to celebrate this special high holy day, as we would call it. And all of a sudden, here these local Galilean people are speaking in languages that the foreigners understand. And the foreigners said, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? How, do we, how are we in Jerusalem and seeing local Jews from Jerusalem who have never been outside of the city limits... And they're speaking things about the wonderful works of God in a language I can understand. It was a miracle. It was a sign. Let's go to verse 12, same chapter. I skipped 8, 9, 10, 11 because that lists all the nationalities. But count it up sometime. There's a, there's a bunch of them there. Verse 12. They were all amazed. They were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Some of them mocked. Look at what Luke says. And they were saying, these men are full of new wine. That's a fancy way of saying they've been hitting the bottle early. Peter stood up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. He said unto them, ye men of Judea, all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, hearken to my words. These are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. The Jewish day starts at 6 a.m., Okay, so Acts 2, 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, that means it was 6 a.m. Pentecost day. The day started. It was 6 a.m. Our day starts at 12, 12.01 a.m. starts a new day. 6 a.m. starts the new day for the Jews. And so he stood up and he said, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. It's the third hour of the day. They, they've not had time to get lit yet. They've not had time to get good and drunk yet. But, he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so Peter reaches way back and he quotes the prophecy of Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions. Old men shall dream dreams. On my servants, handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And Peter goes on to preach from verse 19 all the way to verse 36. He begins to preach a powerful message that winds up with saying, verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God hath made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And he stopped preaching. And they were so troubled by what they heard. Because what Peter told them was, these people that are talking in tongues, they're not drunk. This is the prophetic utterance that Joel talked about in Joel 2.28 in the Old Testament. And Peter said, I'm going to go one further. The Messiah came and you people killed him. Verse 37, when they heard this, the fact that they had killed Jesus, they were pricked in their heart. They said to Peter, the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And look at his response. Repent, verse 38. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, we spent a good part of the year talking about repentance. We spent a good part of the year talking about baptism. Here's where we get to our lesson for the next several weeks. The latter part of verse 38. Look at it. And you shall be filled. You shall receive, he said, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everybody say a gift. It's a gift. You can't go steal it from God. It's a gift. You say, well, what do I have to do to get it, to get this gift? Repent and then be baptized in Jesus' name. And you shall receive the gift. 
Who can have it? Verse 39 tells us, the promise is unto you, Peter was saying to the Jews, and to your children, speaking of future Jewish people, and to all that are afar off. Everybody say, that means me. Paul talked about the Gentiles and said, and to you who were once afar off, now you have been grafted into the family. So he's talking about the Gentile people, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. How many knows God has the power to call any lost soul anywhere at any time? <laughs> Nobody is outside of the reach of God's love. So, now that we've talked about faith, now that we've talked about repentance, now that we've talked about water baptism in Jesus' name, I want to talk about the last step in salvation in the process, and that is the Holy Ghost, receiving the Holy Spirit. When I say the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, those terms are interchangeable. So when we use the term Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, we're talking about the same thing. Please understand, if you're watching online this morning or present in our sanctuary today, and we have a good group of adults here today, if you, if, if you hear that term, it, there are not two different things that we're discussing. There are not times when the Holy Spirit touches you and then times when the Holy Ghost touches you. They're the same thing. Okay? So understand they're interchangeable. In fact, and I'm going to give you a book, chapter, and verse here. We're going to move quickly, so I hope you're able to take good notes and follow along. If not, the beauty of technology is you can go back and listen to it as many times as you want. It's on Facebook. It's on YouTube. And uh, it's on our church website. You have three ways to get to the lessons and the messages. The scripture refers to the Holy Ghost experience in several different ways. I'm going to give you about seven of those ways right now. But there are a myriad and a plethora of ways that the Bible talks about this experience. Here's one of them. Acts 10.45. It's referred to as the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let's go there. Acts chapter 10. Verse number 45, this of course is the story of Cornelius and his family receiving the Holy Ghost while Peter was preaching. Verse 45 says, and they of the circumcision, talking about the Jews, which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter. So understand, Peter's preaching, he's got a, a, a group of Jewish men that he brought with him to be witnesses because Jews were not supposed to go into the homes of Gentiles. So Peter is told by God, go to Cornelius' house. And Peter's like, God, I love you and I trust you, but I don't trust them church people. They're going to crucify me for going in a Gentile's house. So I'm going to get a bunch of them to go with me. And if I get in trouble, they're all getting in trouble. And that's what he did. The Jews were with him. And boy, you know, they were nervous. They're standing over there thinking there's nothing good going to come out of us coming in this Gentile's house, especially a Roman, especially a centurion. He's a soldier. He's the enemy. And while Peter's preaching, Cornelius and all of his family start talking in tongues. They got the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 45. They were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look at the way it is worded there. The gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the same way Peter said it in Acts 2.38. Repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter's preaching in Acts 2.38, calls it a gift. Acts chapter 10, verse 45, the Gentiles all get the Holy Ghost. And the Jews said, we see these Gentiles getting the same gift that we got eight chapters ago. So it's called the gift. Everybody say the gift. It's also called the infilling, Acts 2.4. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. If you have your Bibles, go there. It's referred to as the infilling. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the infilling. If you turn to Acts 1, 5, the prior chapter, it's referred to as a baptism. John truly baptized with water, Jesus said. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. So he's speaking to his disciples. And he said, listen, John talked to you about water baptism. Of course, we know water baptism is still important because they all got rebaptized in Jesus' name. 
But he said, the baptism I'm, I'm going to give you is a baptism of Holy Ghost. Amen. Not many days hence. So in other words, it will happen very soon. Acts 2.38, we understand the Holy Ghost is referred to as receiving something. Receiving something. So I'm just going over different ways that it's talked about in the scripture. It's a gift. It's an infilling. It's a baptism. It's receiving something. Acts 19.6, it's talked about as something that is coming. Something that is coming to you. Acts 19.6, this is the story of where the disciples of John were rebaptized the correct way. And look how Luke records Acts 19.6. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them they spoke with tongues and prophesied so they were praying they lifted up their hands the preacher laid his hands on them and the Holy Ghost came on them okay that's another way that it's talked about Acts 8 16 it's referred to as something that falls on you Acts 8 16 for as yet he was fallen upon none of them only they were baptized in the name of of the Lord Jesus. So it's something that falls upon you. So quick review. It's a gift. It's an infilling. It's a baptism. It's something you receive. It's something that comes on you. It's something that falls on you. And last of all, Acts 10.45, it's something that is poured out upon you. Amen. The, Gen the Jews were amazed because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. The word ghost and the word spirit are both translated from the Greek word pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A. Pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A. And here's what pneuma means. It means a current of air. It means a breath or a breeze. It means soul. It means Spirit. The word reveals the connection between the breath of God and life itself. Look at that Greek word, pneuma. Of course, it has Latin uh, origin, but if you talk about in the English the word pneumonia, it's talking obviously about breathing. The word pneumatic, breathing, There's you see a lot of different uh, correlations there. So the word pneuma means current of air, breath, breeze, soul, spirit. Acts 2, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, Moses writes that God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. So the word ghost, the word spirit, holy ghost, holy spirit means breath. It means air. It means current. It means breeze. Old Testament, Hebrew, God breathed into Adam. He became a living soul. That same breath that caused Adam to stand up and sit up and become alive is the same breath he puts in you and I when he fills us with his spirit. John chapter 20, verse number 22. This is an often misunderstood scripture. And I want to take a moment and explain it. John chapter 20, verse number 22. Jesus had said this. He breathed on his disciples and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So he breathed on his disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. In other words, if you say, no, your sins are not forgiven, then they are not forgiven. Now, I've had people say, well, see there, right there, I don't have to talk in tongues. Jesus just breathed on his disciples. A couple things going on here. First of all, this was before the day of Pentecost. These same disciples, all of them except Judas who betrayed Jesus, got the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2 and spoke with tongues. We know that because Acts chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, names them as being in the upper room. Okay? Look at it. 
Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, Zelotes, Judas, the brother of James. It names them as being in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. So, Jesus breathed on his disciples and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then the next verse, he deputized them. Whosoever sins ye remit shall be remitted. Whosoever sins ye retain shall be retained. What was going on? Jesus was authorizing his disciples to go out and operate in the spirit under the dispensation of that time. Remember, there are three dispensations. There's the Old Testament dispensation. That ended the moment Jesus was born. There's the dispensation of 33 and a half years that lasted the life of Jesus. That ended the moment Jesus died. Remember the thief on the cross. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He's the last one that got in by the skin of his teeth before that door shut. Then there's the dispensation we're in today, which is the church age. It started in Acts chapter 2. So, what dispensation did John 20, 22 occur in? It occurred in the dispensation of the 33 and a half years ministry of the life of Jesus. Jesus is God. So if Jesus, God, looks at his disciples and says, I'm going to give you the only version of the Holy Ghost that's available right now. You're going to get it. I'm going to breathe on you. It's that same breath that caused Adam to sit up in Genesis chapter 2. And it's the same breath, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, that you and I get in the church dispensation. But it was in that short little dispensation, and they were the only ones outside of John the Baptist who was born with the Holy Ghost. They were the only ones to experience the Holy Ghost before the church age. The Bible is so beautiful, isn't it? Amen. So after the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, he gave his disciples one of the most glorious promises that had ever been given to mankind. He promised to send them the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. Acts chapter 2, verse 33. We're going to just flip around in the New Testament. Mainly, we will go into the Old Testament a little bit when we talk about prophecy. But look in verse 33. Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he's talking to the Jews, and he says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. So he promised to send them the promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost, which would endue them with power from on high. Go to Luke 24, 49. We read it earlier, Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Jesus told his disciples he would not leave them comfortless. Look up that word. That's a beautiful word. It means abandoned. It means orphans. I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you abandoned. I will not leave you as orphans. He promised to return to them in the manifestation of the comforter, the Holy Ghost. Look at that beautiful promise. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. John 14, 26, he says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Here's what Jesus was saying. Listen, guys, you had the voice of God speaking in that first dispensation in the Old Testament through the Torah. You have me with you physically in this 33 and a half year dispensation. You can reach out and put your hands on me because I'm walking with you. But in the church dispensation, it won't be the booming voice of God to, to Moses on Mount Sinai. And it won't be me with you in the flesh. It will be the pneuma. It will be the breath living in you. I'll always be with you. Never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God. He promised to return to them in the manifestation of the comforter. Let's go to John 14, 16 through 18. Jesus said, I pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter. Why was Jesus talking about another comforter? Exactly for the reasons I just said. Because he was going to be taken from them, 
crucified, put in the grave, resurrected on high. And he was saying, look, I know I'm not physically going to be here for you to reach out and touch, but I'm going to give you another comforter. We know that's the Holy Ghost. Matter of fact, look what he said in John 14, 16, that he may abide with you forever. Not just 33 and a half years until they crucify him. This Holy Ghost that I'm going to pour out upon you, you get to keep it as long as you want to keep it. And if you keep it till the rapture, it'll take you out of here. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you. Look at this. This is a beautiful one God verse, folks. I'm not even teaching on the oneness of God today, but you can't get away from it. Look at this beautiful scripture. Jesus says, the comforter dwelleth with you. Here's a question. Who was Jesus talking about when he told his disciples, he's dwelling with you right now? He's talking about himself. But look at this. And he shall be in you. If you believe in the Trinity, your eyes are crossing right now because you got problems. Jesus is saying, it's not hard to figure out. Today I'm dwelling with you, but in the church dispensation, I'm going to dwell in you. Because Jesus is the Holy Ghost. I shall not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And then in John 14, 26, he ties up any confusion. Same chapter, eight verses later, he says, But the Comforter, capital C, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Now, I'm not trying to confuse you, but if you look in verses 17 and 18, Jesus says, The Comforter is dwelling with you, but he shall be in you. Verse 26, he says, the comforter is the Holy Ghost. So Jesus is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is Jesus. But, verse 26, it gets better. Whom the Father will send in my name. You say, well, how does that, how does that help me? Well, if you have a moment, and I'm sure you do because you're here. Jesus, in John 14... is expressing to his disciples that he and the Father are one. And if you begin reading, I'm looking here, oh, there it is. Okay, if you begin reading around verse 9, and you read all the way through verse 31, please don't do it this morning while I'm teaching, but if you have a moment sometime, and you're reading these, uh, these chapters, if you're looking at the theme here of the oneness of God, you will understand the takeaway is Jesus is very clearly trying to tell, us, tell his disciples, listen, I and the Father are one. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay? So, again, we're not trying to talk about the oneness of God today because that's a beautiful lesson all by itself. But, really, the oneness of God is not just a topic that you teach on. The oneness of God is a theme that runs through every topic. It's, it's consistent with, you can be talking about creation and you have to talk about the oneness of God. You can be talking about Pentecost and there's the oneness of God. You can be talking about the fruit of the Spirit, there's the oneness of God. So it's not just like a topic that we discuss, it's a theme that covers all topics. Praise God. How many loves the Word of God? Jesus was promising to return his, to His disciples in another form or manifestation. He would no longer be with them in the flesh, but he would return to them in the spirit. And we know that this is what happened in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. It sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this is the only time in the Bible, in Acts, the book of Acts, where people got the Holy Ghost and there was a sign of fire. Every time they got the Holy Ghost, they spoke with tongues. But only one time where there are cloven tongues of fire sitting above their head. Why is this? Because Isaiah the prophet 
talked about a time when the fire of the Spirit, he said, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. Okay? And the Holy Spirit is referred to as fire throughout the Old Testament. And so God knew, this is my interpretation of this, God knew the Jewish people would connect the visual image of fire with the New Testament Holy Spirit. They would connect those dots and say, ah, this must be what the prophets were talking about. They got the Holy Ghost. They knew it was of God. But then in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, the other three times we have record of people speaking with tongues, there were no cloven tongues of fire because they had already made that connection. Beautiful, beautiful scripture there. Acts chapter 2, verse number 3. Verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So there is no doubt in this experience that the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was the promise of the Father. And Peter stood up, verse 33, and he confirmed this when he said, This is the promise of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2.33, which ye now see, the cloven tongues of fire, and ye hear the speaking with tongues. So that's why I believe there were cloven tongues of fire, was so that the people would see and they would hear and believe. Notice this promise was something the bystanders could see, everybody say see, and hear. I'm saying this slowly. It's not because I'm trying to talk down to you or talk, talk to you like a child. But so many people in the Bible Belt teach the Holy Ghost is just something private between you and God. God's Spirit just comes in you and you just know you're saved. No, it's something people around you can see and they can hear. Just like Acts 2, okay? You will not find in the Bible anywhere where somebody was, quote, saved because they got a warm, fuzzy feeling and felt Jesus had come into their heart. That's not in the Bible. That's a man-made statement. Accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Show me that in the book. Who are you and I to accept Jesus? He accepts us. We don't pick him. He picks us. We don't choose him. He chooses us. We're the creation. He's the creator. Can you imagine your child walking up to you on a Monday morning and say, Congratulations, I choose you to be my parent. You'd be like, I birthed you, you little rug rat. You didn't choose me. We made you, right? My dad was uh, in Navy, and I was born in the Navy hospital there in Mayport Base, uh, Navy Base in Jacksonville, Florida, Duval County. And it only cost my dad $5 to have me. $5 to have me, $5 to have my brother. And he reminded me of that frequently growing up. only cost me $5 to have you, boy. You was easy to make. I'll make another one just like you. We'll give you back. Right? You don't choose God. God chooses you. That is such an arrogant statement. Come down here and accept Christ as your Savior. Accept Christ? He accepts me. Who am I to accept the mighty God? The air in my lungs was given to me by Him. I don't accept Him. I'm grateful for Him. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's amazing when you start parsing, part and parceling out some of these statements that we hear all the time in churches and in the church world. and You realize many of them are not even biblical. They're man-made. And they're meant, they're designed to appease to the pride and the arrogance of people. So notice that the promise was something bystanders could see and hear. Those that were receiving the Holy Ghost were acting very peculiar. Matter of fact, it was so peculiar that the onlookers thought they were drunk. They were speaking peculiar. The listeners heard them speaking in strange languages. So once again, the breath of God, the pneuma of God had blown into mankind. However, this time, instead of bringing physical life as it did in Genesis 2 with Adam sitting up and becoming a living soul, today it brought spiritual life. 
In this lesson, in the next several weeks, we're going to talk about what the Bible says about being born of the Spirit. We're going to talk about this issue of speaking in tongues. If people ask you, do y'all, do y'all's church speak in tongues? Don't be ashamed of that. That's something you should not back down. And if you totally understand, and hopefully after some extensive lessons, you'll, you'll feel better about this topic. But the world has really put a negative light on speaking in tongues. And really, it's a spiritual, biblical, very sacred thing that people should not mock. They should not take lightly. And they surely shouldn't make fun of it. I'd be very careful about making fun of something sacred. We have precedent in the scripture that it's dangerous to make fun of something sacred. Remember the little kids that walked out of the village and started mocking the bald head man of God and he turned around and he cursed them and a she-bear came out of the woods and ate 42 children. You better be careful about mocking something sacred. Somebody say amen. Now, We only have a few minutes before we need to take a break. It's 1039, so give me six more minutes. In the Old Testament, we're going to go back to the Old Testament and talk about how the Holy Ghost was prophesied to happen in the New Testament. Okay? So we don't want to just talk about the Holy Ghost in a vacuum and only deal with Acts 2. Let's go way back in the Old Testament and say, what does the Old Testament say about the Holy Ghost? Various kings, prophets, judges, patriarchs were moved upon by the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost did not dwell in them. It just moved on them. Okay? But the prophets foretold of a day when the Holy Spirit would dwell within people of all tribes, languages, and nations. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28 verses 11 and 12. The prophet Isaiah wrote this 730 years before the birth of Christ. 730 years before the birth of Christ, which means it was 763 years before the day of Pentecost. Isaiah said, for with stammering lips, I'm in Isaiah 28 and 11, stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. Now if you go to 1 Corinthians 14.21. 1 Corinthians 14.21. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And he reaches back and he quotes Isaiah. He quotes this same verse that we just read. 1 Corinthians 14, 21. In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. So, Isaiah prophesied about it. It happened. And Paul looked back and said, That's what Isaiah was talking about. When he was talking about stammering lips and another tongue. How about Ezekiel? Ezekiel 36. And we're going to go in in, uh, not necessarily any order. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse number 26. Ezekiel was 586 years before the birth of Christ. Look at what God says through the prophet Ezekiel. A new heart... Will I also give unto thee? A new spirit will I put within thee. Not upon thee, but within thee. I will take away that stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you. He says it twice, folks. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. What was Ezekiel talking about? God was saying to the Jewish people, listen, you're not able to keep the law because the flesh can't keep the law. But there's going to come a day I'm going to take that stony heart of flesh out, put a new heart of flesh in, put my spirit in you, and you will be able, through the power of the Holy Ghost, you'll be able to live a clean life. Not perfect because we're all human, but a clean life. 
You'll have the power in you, the deutimus, the dynamite, the power, and the pneuma, the breath. You'll have all of that in you so you'll be able to get up and say, today I'm going to live for God. Temptation comes your way. You say, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. The prophet Joel. Let's go to Joel 2.28. We read this earlier. Joel 2.28, he lived 800 years before Christ. It shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters shall prophesy, old men shall dream dreams, young men shall see visions. So on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost fell, Peter quoted Joel 2.28 and Acts 2.17 and 18. He reached back and quoted. That was a common theme that the disciples would do when they were dealing with these hardcore, crusty Jewish people. These self-righteous, pharisaical Jewish people who were stuck in the law. Peter said, I'm going to take your law and I'm going to use your own law to prove to you this is prophecy being fulfilled. And that's how they would believe because they believe the law. So Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost says, look, you don't, don't, let, don't take my word for it. How about what Joel said in 228? And they said, oh, Joel prophesied. This is what's happening. And 3,000 of them got baptized. That's why Paul quoted, of course, the prophet Jeremiah as well. Isaiah, excuse me. So John the Baptist, and I'll, I'll close with this, he's quoted in all four Gospels as proclaiming the coming of the Holy Ghost. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus, every one of the four synoptic Gospels, he talks about the coming of the Holy Ghost. Luke 3, 16, John answers, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And what are the next three words? Say it again. And with fire. So the Old Testament prophecies talked about fire with relation to the Spirit of God. John the Baptist said, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire, that's why on the day of Pentecost, that's the only time cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them. Because the Jews were able to see that and hear that and say, Aha, that's Old Testament prophecy. And that's what John the Baptist is talking about. This must be that new Holy Spirit. Somebody say praise the Lord. Has anybody learned anything? Well, we love the word, don't we? I love good teaching, and I love good preaching. I don't think I love anyone more than the other. I just love it all. Amen. And when you fall in love with the Word, it doesn't matter how the Word gets to you. You just enjoy it. Let's stand together. God bless you. We're going to take a break, and our children will be coming in in a moment. We'll use the restroom, get some water. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your Word on this Sunday morning. Thank you for allowing us to get out of bed and come to church and just absorb the Word of God. We know that listening to the Word and, and being together as the Word is taught, it is not a wasted exercise. It's certainly not wasted time. It's time for us to grow. It's time for the Spirit and the Word to agree and connect in our lives. And we just want to be more mature every time we hear a lesson in the Word of God taught. More mature in our spirit walk. God bless our service in the next little bit. Let us have a wonderful time in the house of God today. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, praise the Lord. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you. Greet one another. Fellowship.